In 1890, the superintendent of the United States Census made a shocking statement. Incessant westward migration had finally erased the American frontier. It was closed. Closed? This news dismayed many people, including historian Frederick Jackson Turner. The frontier, they said, was what had made America, well, America. Now what? Was the nation destined to go soft? Lose its vitality? Some answered no. All we needed to do was find new frontiers, somewhere beyond our current borders. Somewhere nearby, perhaps. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 31 in which we take up the story of a long-forgotten American colony in Cuba. We are coming to you this week from the Jose Marti Studios, located on the campus of Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Pushing us ahead into uncharted territory, as always, is our intrepid executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's up this week at In the Past Lane? Well, here in central Massachusetts, it's summer and the weather is absolutely spectacular. The mighty Boston Red Sox are in first place. And the backyard garden is looking pretty good. I still haven't made it to the beach yet, but that might happen as soon as this weekend. So, all in all, life is good. As for the podcast, I'm hard at work on many new episodes. And starting this week, I'm planning to release new episodes every week, instead of the current plan of every two weeks. In other news, I've started a YouTube channel where I've posted some videos of my talks. I'll be adding more content in the coming weeks, and you can find it by going to YouTube and searching for In the Pass Lane. And let me know what you think. And one last thing, some exciting news. In the Pass Lane is eligible for the annual podcast awards. This is sort of like the Oscars or the Emmys for podcasting. So here it comes, people. I need your help. Finalists for these awards are determined by the number of votes, or what they call nominations, by the public. So I'd really appreciate it if you took a minute to nominate us. Just head over to podcastawards.com. That's podcastawards.com and click on nominations. You'll find In the Past Lane in the society and culture category. Every nomination helps, so I'd really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, people, we're heading to the Caribbean, so better put on some sunscreen. Your journey in the past lane begins now. Cuba is back in the news. Just a few weeks ago, President Trump announced that he was ending, or at least curtailing, many of the policies implemented by the Obama administration that were aimed at improving relations between the United States and Cuba. It's just the latest chapter in the long story of U.S.-Cuba relations. How long, you ask? Well, it goes back hundreds of years. Way back in the colonial period, American merchants engaged in a huge and lucrative trade with Cuba, much of it illegal. In 1808, Fresh off his successful Louisiana purchase, President Thomas Jefferson tried to buy Cuba from Spain. In the late 1840s, groups of Americans who wanted to expand the nation's slave economy funded three private military invasions of Cuba, hoping to seize it for annexation to the U.S. These so-called filibusters failed in their quest, but numerous proposals to purchase Cuba would be floated by U.S. officials for decades to come. The turning point, of course, came in the 1890s when Cuban revolutionaries began a revolt against Spanish colonial rule. Now, if you want the full story on what eventually led the U.S. to declare war on Spain in 1898 in the name of liberating Cuba, you should check out episode 26 of In the Past Lane, where we go deep on the Spanish-American War. In this episode, 
we explore a fascinating and little-known story that began in the aftermath of that war, the establishment of an American colony on a small island just off the Cuban mainland, the Isle of Pines. In the early 20th century, several thousand Americans, inspired by the same spirit of manifest destiny that had impelled earlier generations of Americans westward, headed south to start new lives on this tiny American outpost. To help us learn more about this remarkable community, I'll sit down with historian Michael Nagel, author of the book, America's Forgotten Colony, Cuba's Isle of Pines. Sit tight, people. In the Past Lane, a podcast about history and why it matters. We'll be right back. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. Okay, we are back at In the Past Lane. With me now is historian Michael Nagel. Michael is an assistant professor of history at Nichols College in Dudley, Massachusetts. He is a scholar of the history of U.S. diplomacy and foreign relations. And for a couple of years, Michael was a colleague of mine here at Holy Cross College. Good to see you again, Michael. Welcome to In the Past Lane. Thanks for having me, Ed. Good to see you again. Great. Well, I'm very excited to talk to you today about your new book, America's Forgotten Colony, Cuba's Isle of Pines. So I'd like to begin by asking you to give us some background on this tiny little island with a big history. What do our listeners need to know about Cuba's Isle of Pines? So the Isle of Pines itself is off the southwest coast of mainland Cuba. It's about three-fourths the size of Rhode Island. It's in about roughly 40 miles right off the mainland Cuba coast, almost due south of Havana. Right, and so it has it's a little piece of Cuba, and... It has a long history. We could go way, way back into earlier times in the Spanish colonization and so forth. But the part that your book really starts focusing on, it picks up the story in the late 19th century with the Spanish-American War and the U.S. intervention essentially to throw the colonizing Spanish out ostensibly to, to help Cuba win its independence. And it sort of does and sort of doesn't. So maybe you could tell us the Cuba post-war 101, the Platt Amendment and all that. Right. So ostensibly, the United States gets involved against Spain, ostensibly on behalf of the Cuban rebels. But after the war, again, a very short war in the summer of 1898, the United States does take possession of Spain's former colonies. But there's the caveat that the U.S. control of Cuba is only going to be temporary. Now, it's around that same time that a lot of Americans were thinking about perhaps annexing Cuba. That had been in the political ether, almost going back to the very early days of the Republic. But shortly after the war, it's become pretty apparent that the United States has no interest in annexing Cuba, yet it still has a number of interests, uh, strategic interests, commercial interests. But the idea of annexing all of Cuba doesn't really have as much appeal anymore. And that's in large part because of, of racial concerns. But there is one piece that some Americans are interested in, and that's the Isle of Pines. There was a particular clause in the Platt Amendment that said that the United States and Cuba would have a future treaty in which to discuss whether the United States would annex the Isle of Pines. And were they thinking economically here or also militarily? That, I mean, at this point, one of the big questions in the air as the U.S. sort of reaches out to the world is having strategic naval bases around the world. And is that one of the concerns or is, is it sort of a mix of both? So uh, from the government's perspective, they're certainly looking at it more from a military and strategic perspective. From the private citizens who want to go to the aisle, they're thinking of it more in terms of commercial interests. So on the government side, particularly from the Theodore Roosevelt administration, they're looking at a potential naval base in Cuba. Turns out that the waters around the Isle of Pines are very shallow, particularly to the north, the east, and the west, too shallow to sustain a naval base. So the Roosevelt administration had no interest in trying to convert the Isle of Pines into a, a naval base of any sort. So they were perfectly willing to trade any claims to the Isle of Pines for the right to lease a base elsewhere in Cuba, which would become 
Guantanamo Bay, which Guantanamo the United Bay. States still has to this day. I believe I've heard of that yes. in, in, in recent uh, years, recent decades. Yeah, and that's another one of those strange footnotes on the Spanish-American War and, and our relations with Cuba is that we have this American military base in this island nation that for a long time we've considered an enemy. And then the lesser known story is the story of the Isle of Pines, which doesn't fully become an American possession. But what happens essentially after the, the war, the language of, these, of the treaty, the language of the Platt Amendment, leave open the possibility that annexation might happen, if not right away, down the road. And so a lot of Americans look to this small island off of the island of Cuba and see it as a place to move. And so tell us more about this American colony off of Cuba that has a very distinct character, distinct culture, and distinct outlook. And who are these people? What are their expectations? Are they, do they see themselves as following the footsteps of other Americans who have headed out west, in this case heading south? Exactly. The estimates range from roughly 10,000 Americans who might have bought land on the isle to maybe as many as 2,000 who established residences there. A lot of the Americans who went were farmers who were from the U.S. Northeast and the Midwest. They were looking for a winter home. They were looking for a place in which to retire. Some of them were looking for a place for opportunity to basically restart their lives. Some were even just looking simply for adventure. Right. So, it seemed like a cool thing to do. And you say a lot of farmers and the farmers who do go, or the Americans who do go, who are list thinking about economic opportunity. Are they mostly looking at the island as a plantation economy or a farming economy that they can take advantage of and grow food for export and that sort of thing? Exactly, yes. Prior to the U.S. presence there, the Isle of Pines had been widely considered a backwater under Spain. It was really just a local economy. They weren't really growing anything for export. There really wasn't much there. So American entrepreneurs see the isle as an opportunity, a place in which to develop an export-based agricultural economy. And this is something that really resonates, I think, among these settlers who go at the turn of the century. This is coming at a time in the United States when the frontier is believed to be closed. This idea of, uh, of the United States moving away from the Jeffersonian ideal of an agriculturally based economy at the turn of the century, the United States is now clearly much more urbanized and industrialized. And a lot of the advertisements in which these American landholding companies that had bought land from former Spanish and Cuban landowners. They were couching a lot of the promotional activity in terms of preserving some sort of agrarian ethic that resonated with a lot of these farmers in the U.S. So where were they advertising? That's really interesting. So how would a farmer in, say, Kansas get the idea in his head that he should move to Cuba? Where would he read this? So a lot of them, they'd be in newspapers. They would have the prospectuses from these companies. They would take advertisements out in, in a lot of local newspapers. And they were coming places like, you know, in upstate New York, Iowa, Minnesota. It seems like a lot of the settlers were clustered together. So newspaper advertisements, but also word of mouth yeah. was really important because they would get to know somebody who might have been an agent who was selling land there. And then they would, you know, oh, my neighbors bought some land and that neighbor bought some land. So I'm going to buy some land too. So that mm -hmm. seems to be a pretty popular way. So word of mouth was really important. And what I found in some of the few registries that I was able to come across, a lot of them were coming from the same towns. Yeah, so it's almost like immigration. One person from one Italian village goes to America, and then next thing you know, 100 people from that region have gone not only to America, but to the same city, in some cases to the same location, same section of, of New York, for example. I did find a number of people who were second generation Americans who in their family history, they could remember traveling to the United States. So they were also apt to go to someplace new. And certainly what they were looking to do is not necessarily emigrate away from America. They were presuming that the Isle of Pines was or would become U.S. territory. They really took on this kind of pioneer ethos, which was still somewhat fresh in, in American memory. They thought that they were carrying this on to the next place. Right. And so they're like good you know, investors or speculators. They're thinking, well, let's get there now. Let's buy the land now. Let's get something going. And then when the U.S. does annex the territory, we'll be sitting pretty. We will be you know, in this, in this new American territory. It's very interesting. So when you say there are 2,000 Americans there in the, by the early 20th century, 2,000 out of what, – what, how does that rate in terms of the overall population? Does that make them the dominant group or 
50 50? What, what, how significant is that population? It's pretty significant. At the close of the War of 1898, uh, the United States had conducted a census in Cuba, and there was roughly a little more than 3,000 people living there at the, at the close of the, the 19th century. And probably around that time that the U.S. community was at its peak, roughly around World War I, there was probably about a little more than 4,000 people living in Cuba. So the U.S. population was pretty significant and they were you know, really the dominant landowners at this time. They were providing jobs as farmhands, as domestic workers to the locals. So they were critical to the local economy. And the locals, those who were natives of the Isle of Pines, the Pineros, they were instrumental in allowing you know, American businesses to grow in any way, shape, or form. I mean, first you had Spanish and Cuban landowners who were willing to sell land right. to Americans at a time when there was really no real estate industry whatsoever. So those Cuban and Spanish landowners who had held this land for generations, and it really wasn't worth much, when Americans come in, they are all too happy to sell to these Americans. So on, one, on the one hand, they're very important in that sense. But they're also important in the sense that as these American businesses and citrus groves were literally starting to get off the ground, the local workforce was critical in clearing land, in planting, in picking fruit, in packing fruit and shipping it and so forth. So the local population is, is critical to these enterprises as well. It's not just the Americans themselves who are doing this. Right. It's, it's a partnership. But that partnership only goes so far. What you write about in your book is this first period from 1898 to roughly the mid-1920s, these Americans are thinking annexation, and they're also really not necessarily thinking about integration or developing anything more than a working relationship with the local population. They live by themselves, they set up their own institutions, they set up their own nightclubs and schools, and really a, a community within the community to a large degree. So how does that work, and does that create tension, and ultimately what kind of community do they develop in this kind of sense of themselves as a separate community? The sovereignty question, I find, particularly in the first quarter century, is what's at the heart of all the tension between Americans and Pineros during this time frame. So what happens is that this question of sovereignty, Americans believe that this is going to become a U.S. state in the future, and they're really not all that fond of working with Cubans, but they do so begrudgingly. They try to keep themselves apart as much as they can, but well, they only would begrudgingly admit the fact that Cubans were instrumental to these enterprises. These Americans believe that they are trying to, you know, Americanize the Isle. The more that they can Americanize the Isle, the more that they can present a case for annexation. They can present a case to the U.S. Senate to reject the hay Quesada Treaty. That's in the name of the treaty between U.S. Secretary of State John Hay, Cuban Foreign Minister Gonzalo de Quesada, that recognized Cuban sovereignty over the Isle of Pines. It's signed by the two in 1904, but it doesn't get ratified by the U.S. Senate until 1925. And the more that they can establish these institutions like social clubs, like schools, Protestant churches, they have their own English language newspapers, they use the American dollar. All these elements, if they can Americanize the aisle, that improves their case for annexation. And annexation is important for a couple of reasons. You know, number one, it's, it's important because they want to maintain their connections to the United States. They're not, they don't feel like they're fleeing the U.S. They're not emigrating away from it. They believe that they are pioneers and that the flag is going to follow them. So on one level, that's important to their identity. Most of those individuals from the early 20th century don't necessarily think of themselves as pineros or becoming part of Cuba. They try to maintain their Americanness, So that's one. But number two, an annexation is also important because it helps their commercial bottom line. Anything that they were then growing and selling back to the United States would be subject to tariff. And it was. Right. And that they're trying to scale that tariff wall because the tariff is undercutting their bottom lines. So they want to get around that tariff. So there's also a self-interested commercial motive in this as well. So, and as you say, the next chapter, the next phase is 1925 when that treaty is ratified and when essentially Cuban sovereignty is, so is settled. That's a settled issue. Cuba possesses, owns that island. And that really changes the dynamic. It, in some ways, I don't know if it leads to an exodus of Americans, but certainly there seems to be 
a significant exodus of Americans in the years that follow from, say, maybe a high of 2,000 to down to a few hundred people by the 40s and 50s. But the American community doesn't disappear. And not only does it persist in smaller form, but it changes and changes in its attitude about the local population and also what their long-term prospects are there. So tell us about this next phase. By 1925, the American colony is already in evident decline. Most estimates suggest that maybe the, the, in terms of residences, it's probably around 2,000 people who had a, a home there by time of World War I. But by 1925, only about 700 had remained. By that point, a lot of the U.S. businesses, particularly the citrus groves, a lot of them thought that they were going to grow citrus, sell it back to the United States and make their money that way and be able to sustain themselves in Cuba that way. A lot of those businesses were failing by the mid-20s, in large part because of problems with transportation infrastructure. It took a long time to get the fruit from tree to table in the United States. There were also issues with periodic hurricanes, which would wipe out the groves. There was a devastating one in 1917, an even more devastating one in 1926. So just as these groves are going to get off the ground, they are literally destroyed by these hurricanes. And also just simply poor business decisions. So this is a community that is on its heels by the early 20s, takes a body blow with the passage of Hei Quesada in 1925. Then there's a hurricane in 1926. And by the early 1930s, there's roughly a little more than 300 Americans who are left. So this is a community that is really reeling in the 1930s and the 1940s. So the community gets really small, and obviously their economic fortunes change, as you point out, but they persist, and they do tend to blend more into the, into the local and develop more cultural exchanges, more intermarriage, more relations with the local population. And then towards the 1940s and is it 1940s, 1950s, there's kind of a new influx of Americans begin to move there, and they have very different ideas about why they're moving there from the previous generations of sort of frontier types. So tell us about that transition and and then that new influx that happens just before the rise of some guy named Fidel Castro. Yeah, so by the 1950s, you ha- there is an, uh, a new influx of Americans who are coming in, and they don't bring with them the same kind of baggage of the conflicts over sovereignty as others had in the early 20th century. A lot of the Americans who come in, and, and they're not coming in the same kinds of numbers as they were in the early 20th century, but Americans who are going to the aisle are retirees, they are teachers, they are missionaries, they are tourists, and they are much more integrated into the broader Isle community than those other U.S. citizens from the early 20th century. So that totally changes the dynamic on the Isle. It's a very multi-ethnic community where you don't just have Americans and Cubans, but you do have people from the West Indies, you have people from Canada, you have people from Europe, people from Asia, and it's a very kind of cosmopolitan community. And in the 1950s, Cuba was looking to develop its tourism industry in particular. The Isle was seen as one place in, in which to really do that. It had the tremendous benefit of being a a free port. Uh, This was designated by Cuban President Fulgencio Batista. Uh, In the 1950s, he declared the Isle as a free port, which meant that there would be no taxes on imports and exports. So that made things a lot less expensive. And so you'd start to see more Americans come in. And, And this is something where Cuban businessmen were encouraging this. And what I kind of see in my own research is that there was a greater spirit of cooperation between Americans and Cubans in this time frame, much more so than 50 years earlier. We start to see uh, more social engagements and social interactions between Americans and Cubans. There's an American school, it's called the American Central School, that had been created in 1926, particularly with the idea of trying to inculcate American customs with American children living there. But by the mid-20th century, as a lot of American settlers and, and, and residents left, the school remains and they're trying to cater more to Cuban students and also other foreign nationals who are living there. And the school is also another important meeting place for children to develop friendships. And you start to see the U.S. government 
particularly through a branch of the State Department, which recognizes, oh, this school could be very helpful in helping to develop so-called American soft power and all these ideas. So the school is a really important breeding ground for these relationships between Americans and Cubans and other foreign nationals. Yeah. And so while this is happening, uh, in fact, one of the most, perhaps the most famous resident of the island, if you want to call him a resident, is Fidel Castro. He's a young radical and would be revolutionary. And he's imprisoned by the Batista regime in the early 1950s because there's a huge prison on the island that I think also dates back to the 1920s. And Castro eventually gets out after a couple of years of imprisonment and begins to lay the groundwork for his revolution and the ousting of the regime. And what begins, not immediately, but soon thereafter, a pretty hostile relationship with the United States, sort of mutually hostile. So tell us about that transition and what that, how that impacts this kind of fascinating multicultural American colony. Oh, it changes everything. I mean, the Castro's revolution certainly changes Cuba, obviously. But it, on the aisle, it does change everything. Not necessarily immediately, but within the first year or two, there are certainly evident changes in a variety of ways. You know, number one was that what had been developing as a tourist driven industry on the aisle by the late 1950s, that dries up pretty quickly. By 1960, there are many more expropriations of foreign owned property. So those couple hundred Americans who are living on the aisle by that point, as they see their property getting expropriated by the Cuban government by around starting around 1960, they start to leave take all that they can with them, and they leave the aisle. Those who remain do so because simply they can't afford to go back, or they may have owned just enough property underneath the threshold for expropriation that they decided to remain. But what I read from a lot of sources is that the the tenor of the relationship changes, and not necessarily between Americans and the Pinedos who had lived there for years, but what Castro also does is send an influx of Cubans from the mainland to the aisle to help to develop it. And some of the American sources and even some, from some Pineros noticed that that changed the social dynamics significantly. There was a lot more tension, again, not between the Americans and the Pineros who had lived there for years, who had known Americans, but from those who were coming from the mainland to help to develop the aisle in a variety of ways, uh, particularly in terms of building up schools and building up infrastructure and, and, so, and building up cooperatives in, in the style that, that Castro had wanted. And that changes the social dynamic completely to the extent that by 1961, there are literally, somebody counted this, there were 35 U.S. citizens left there in 1961. By 1971, there were seven U.S. citizens who were still living there. You know, one of the arresting photos in your book shows the current state of the so-called American Cemetery. And, you know, at one point, it was this great gem of, of an institution you know, where Americans buried their dead, but also it suggested permanence, suggested long-term plans for annexation. And now it's really kind of overgrown and it's not really particularly well cared for and really is in a way its own kind of a ruin. So what, what do we see? What did you see when you were doing your research and, and had the chance to go there? What's it like? Is other beyond the cemetery, are there other pieces of evidence that harken back to this now gone American colony? Not much. I mean, there is the, the cemetery. The other is the American Central School. I have a picture of it in my book as it stood in, in the 1950s and as it looked in, in 2010. It's just a, a facade. It's, it's dilapidated. And taking a look at that, I thought it was very appropriate of the kind of decayed relationship between the United States and Cuba as it right. was in 2010. Mm -hmm. So those are really two of the only markers that I can think of that illustrate that there was a significant American presence there. After most of the Americans left in 1959, 1960, Castro ushered in an, an, a number of changes, particularly schools that were designed to bring in students from around the world to learn about the values of socialism and so forth. The population skyrocketed. The population right at the, at the cusp of the revolution was roughly around 10 or 11,000 people. By the close of the 20th century, there were roughly 86,000 people living there, and a lot of them were influxed, uh, brought in from, from mainland mm -hmm. Cuba, in large part to dilute the pro-Batista sentiment that had been in place on the, on the aisle, and also to develop the aisle. You know, Castro had said that he was trying to bring the aisle out of its historical separation from Cuba. 
the Isle had often been referred to among Cubans as the Forgotten Isle right. or the Siberia of Cuba. <laughs> pretty, ni- pretty nice Siberia, but uh, I understood in terms of isolation and, and being cut off. And part of Castro's effort is to rename it in 1978. What's the thinking behind calling it the Island of Youth? I think the idea for Castro was to get the idea that this was a new island. He wanted to turn this into an education center. I think there's also this lingering pro-Batista sentiment that was still there among people who had lived on the Isle mm-hmm. for years. So he's trying to almost rebrand the Isle as a place of education, particularly for students from around the world and, and bring them in to, to learn about socialism. Yeah. The values of the revolution and all. And so let's widen the lens a little bit here. I always ask the guests that I interview, stuff about what you've written is always fascinating in and of itself. Just interesting chapters of history, particularly one like this that's not well known. But history always should have something to say about the present and have some way to help us understand the present and think about the future. So is there anything in this story of the Isle of Pines and Cuba that speaks to us today in 2017 or can inform our ideas about policy towards Cuba and so forth? Certainly. I think here we are in in, in May 2017, and it's uh, not quite sure where U.S.-Cuban relations are going with this current administration. But under the Obama administration, opening up U.S.-Cuban relations was something that was very important and something that was a, a long time coming. And you know, I think there are certainly lessons from the U.S. experience in the Isle of Pines that, that we can take. Whereas in the early 20th century, the Americans who went there were, quite frankly, chauvinistic in thinking that the American way of life was superior, that they weren't shy in sharing that idea. They were trying to certainly impress that upon the locals. And I think that sense of chauvinism brought about a lot of tension and conflict. That's not quite so evident in the mid-20th century when Americans are one of a number of other nationalities that are living there and in a pretty cooperative and somewhat harmonious fashion. And I think those lessons of being able to work more cooperatively and directly with Cubans I think that's more of the model that I would like to see U.S.-Cuban relations going forward, particularly in the present. You know, there's I, I think there's certainly a lot of businesses, both agricultural and commercial, that are kind of salivating at the prospect of having a foothold in Cuba once again. And so if we want to make sure that the U.S. and Cuba are partners and are working cooperatively going forward, I think the model of how that happened on the island in the 1950s, I think that's hopefully a more illustrative model that we can follow going forward. You know, we'll see which which path American businesses and politicians end up taking. I think right now it, we're kind of in a pause about where U.S. and Cuban relations are going. So we'll see which way which, which way it goes. All right. Well, hopefully in that pause, people pick up your book. America's Forgotten Colony, Cuba's Isle of Pines. Michael Nagel, thanks so much for coming by and talking to us at In the Pass Lane. Ed, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Great. Michael Nagel is the author of America's Forgotten Colony, Cuba's Isle of Pines, published by Cambridge University Press and available everywhere. Well, people, as always, this has been a lot of fun, but I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank you for listening, and I encourage you to weigh in with comments, questions, and suggestions via social media and at our website, inthepastlane.com. At this site, you'll also find a show page for this episode that includes links, essays, images, and further reading suggestions related to all the things we've talked about in this episode. I'm in the Past Lanes host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world, so let's pay attention to it. Thank you for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the Past Lane. Hey, Lulu, did you know that when you say the word no, it sounds like it has two syllables? No. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 